students, staff, and faculty. Before we get started with uh, my research project, I want to let everyone know, um, just take a second and close your eyes so you can kind of understand this project. So once you close your eyes, when you're opening it back up, open it up really slowly and stop like halfway through, all right? Either this, or if you can't even open your eyelid at all, this is what a condition we call ptosis, all right? Ptosis is that inability to fully open that eyelid. And everyone in this classroom, if that's what you're experiencing, is gonna require surgery. So that brings us beautifully back into our topic today, a cadaveric study of the levator palpebrae aponeurosis. If you haven't so opened your eyes, please open your eyes now. <laughs> All right, before we jump in, let me give you a little bit of background information about the eye so we can kind of see what muscle we're specifically dealing with and where that is. As you guys can see here, this is the eye. This is a, the structures that surround the eye. And although the eye is like a unique organ, it sits in its own socket right here in the orbit. And what we're dealing with is everything above the eye. All right, so this is our main muscle. This is the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. Um, here I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the layers so we can see what layer we're trying to get to in this study. The first thing you guys are gonna see, here's the eyeball to orient you. This is from a superior or anterior approach. This is the skin right in front. This is our upper eyelid and this is our lower eyelid. We first go through the skin. So this is the skin number one. Number two is we're gonna go through the orbicularis oculi muscle for that second layer. The third layer we're gonna to get to now is like a fatty tissue area. Once we pass that fatty tissue area, we get to this uh, fascia called the orbital septum. The orbital septum is a fascia-like ring that surrounds and um, anchors all those surrounding muscles and structures to that orbit. And once we pass that orbital septum, we finally get to the muscle we're concerned about right here, that levator palpebrae superioris muscle. I also want to point out that on the underside of the eyelid and behind that levator is what we call the conjunctiva. All right, right here, number six. Here's another good uh, diagram that can kind of show us that muscle. Although the levator um, starts and originates back in the orbit with all the other muscles, it is the most superior muscle that extends all the way up and forms this aponeurosis. And aponeurosis is like a flat tendinous uh, structure that anchors muscles to another um, structure in the body. And in this case, it's anchoring it to the superior tarsal plate, otherwise known as the upper eyelid. So what we're specifically looking at in this study is the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. We're looking at the muscle aponeurosis junction. So this aponeurosis junction, this is where the muscle is transitioning into aponeurosis itself. And then we're looking at the aponeurosis and where it's attaching to on the eyelid. Now thinking about the function, I made you guys close your eyes and now open it. That's normally, it functions to elevate the eyelid. If it's not working, we're gonna see things like this where the, eyelid, where the patient comes in and the eyelid is not fully being opened. This is called blepharotosis. Blepharo meaning eyelid, otherwise known as ptosis as well. Um, the cause, as we said, it's LPS, mal uh, muscle uh, malfunctioning. And the consequences of it is uh, developing a visual disorder known as lazy eye or amelopia. It can also have nerve atrophy because now your vision is distorted and we're not using those nerve fibers, which is really dangerous in the future. So what we need and the only treatment option is surgery. There are two types of ptosis that I'm gonna talk about next and that's congenital and acquired ptosis. When we're talking about congenital, that means you're born with this condition. So what happens is in the womb that muscle is improperly um, being formed and we'll actually see babies, like in this picture, uh, presenting with a case of ptosis. And this is extremely, um, extremely uh, scary because it has to be taken care of immediately. Um, for acquired ptosis, this is when ptosis is acquired later on in life. And the most common is the aponeurotic type. This is what the aponeurosis we're talking about. It becomes loosened or stretched and that's due to aging. Um, that is where now patients, older patients, will present with lower eyelids and they cannot elevate it. Neurogenic ptosis is when now that nerve that's innervating that muscle, the LPS muscle, doesn't function, such as in cases of myasthenia gravis. Myogenic ptosis is now where that muscle itself cannot function, such as in muscular dystrophy. Something's building up in the muscle and it cannot contract. Mechanical ptosis is another really common uh, cause of ptosis, and this is where you have extra skin, you have extra fat, or some mass that's protruding and pushing on that muscle, so now it can't work. 
And traumatic ptosis is where we have injury to the eyelid, and now the patient will present with a uh, ptosis. In any case, the only treatment option is surgery. And today I'm gonna to talk about the three most common procedures used today. The first two directly deal with that aponeurosis that we're talking about, and the last is actually used uh, very rarely in an extreme cases of complete ptosis that I really can't open. The first is called an external levator approach or treatment. This is what uh, transcutaneous approach, as you guys can see in this picture, we're cutting open the eye straight from that skin in that first layer. We're gonna go all the way down to the levator uh, uh, muscle, pull the muscle out, make an incision, and then um, stretch the remaining aponeurosis, um, excise that aponeurosis, and then reattach that muscle, the levator muscle, back to the superior tarsal plate. The internal levator procedure is also very common. And this is now where we're going, making a transconjunctival approach. So what we're doing is we're inverting that eyelid, cutting through the eyelid, and um, going straight to that, through that conjunctiva, doing the same thing we did in the external approach where we excised extra aponeurosis and reattached the muscle back to the superior tarsal plate. In the last procedure, it's called a frontalis sling fixation. This is now in rare cases where you the patient cannot open his eyes at all. We're gonna insert a rod in that upper eyelid and attach the muscle to the frontalis muscle which sits on our forehead. Now we're using external face muscles to help us elevate that eyelid. In any case, in all surgeries, it has its complications. And ironically, in ptosis surgery, the major complication is a requirement of now a secondary surgery. Why, you ask? This is because there's an improper correction of that ptosis procedure. Either we're removing too much aponeurosis and the patient is now experiencing dry eye symptoms, or we don't remove enough and the patient has a lesser degree of ptosis than it began with originally. Another complication is asymmetry. So a lot of things in oculoplastics have to do with aesthetics. So for this purpose, if the patient notices it's not the same as the other eye or something, once again, we require a secondary surgery. Um, there also is a lot of swelling and bruising that happen, and the major uh, complication overall is due to undocumented eyelid anatomy and its variations that we can see once we get um, into the procedure, which leads us into today's topic and my purpose of the study, which is a descriptive study on the upper eyelid to understand um, better ptosis and to also um, help in oculoplastic procedures and making safer and less complications. Specifically, we're studying that measurement of how long does that levator aponeurosis extend to? Where is it specifically attaching to? Is there det detachment points? And we're looking at how far from that superior eyelid does the MAJ lie? Remember the MAJ is that muscle aponeurosis junctioning. We're also looking at is there an absence or presence of a fat pad within the eye when we're doing this dissection, which takes us right to our methods. What we did is we had 44 eyelids from uh, formalin and bomb cada Caucasian cadavers, and what we did is a sup uh, superorbital dissection. So as you guys can see here, we actually made an incision here above the eyebrow, and this is like how we would in an external levator procedure. So here's the upper eyelid skin. What we did next is we reflected that eyelid. So, what we can see next is the orbicularis oculi muscle. Remember those layers that we were talking about. So we reflected the skin, now we see that muscle. Once we excise that muscle as well, we reflect it back, and you guys can see the orbital septum, the next layer, that fascial ring that surrounds the eye. From there, we took back the orbital septum, and the first thing we ran into was that fat pad. And once we remove that fat pad, we can see our LPS muscle right here. So, this is a really nice diagram of what we're trying to get to. At the top, you guys can see that LPS muscle, okay, those red bands, and we can see that MAJ where it transitions into an aponeurosis. The aponeurosis then we can see extending down and it attaches to the superior tarsal plate right here. In this picture, we have reflected back the orbital septum. We've reflected back also the orbicularis oculi muscle so we can really nicely see everything we're looking for. For measurement purposes, we used a micrometer and measured in millimeters. What we did is we took measurements from the lateral and medial canthus, just the corners of our eyelid, and then we took a midpoint of that level. We marked that midpoint, and then we went back to the MAJ. We tried to measure how far back from that central point of the eyelid is that MAJ. And then from that MAJ, we measured how far does that aponeurosis now extend. Now, bringing us to our results that we found in our study. 
So the first thing we wanted to look at, we were thinking, okay, so there's right eye and there's left eye. Now, does eye orientation make a difference on our statistics that we're finding? When we looked at our results, we noticed that the results were actually very similar, not uh, dependent, uh, when it didn't depend on eye orientation. So we, uh, in, for statistics purposes, we ran a pair t-test to see what the dependence would be upon cadaver. And it was not significant. Thus, we could term each eye as a, an individual sample. This really helped for our statistics because we can now use either all 21 and 23 samples from left and right eye as an individual sample, making us a total of 44 samples. Next, what we looked at is gender, and we looked at age. We're trying to see does gender or age make a difference for the aponeurosis lengths and the MAJ length. For both um, gender and age, we saw negative correlation. So if, uh, for gender purposes, we saw that if you were female, you had a shorter um, aponeurosis length. And for um, the MAJ length, we also saw a, negative, uh, a shorter length. For age, if you were older, we also saw a shorter length and a shorter um, MAJ length. In both cases, however, our statistics proved that it was not significant. Now going to look at the results for each individual variable that we were measuring, we looked first at that aponeurosis length. Remember that that muscle extends into the aponeurosis. So what we found on average is that to be 10.63 millimeters in length. When we looked at the MAJ length, how far back from the central lid where it uh, actually was inserted, we found it to be 13.9 millimeters far back. And what was really interesting is we found that the aponeurosis attachment um, was more common to go into um, the orbital septum, which was that fascial ring around the eye. As you guys can see in this picture over here, this is the levator palpebrae superioris muscle at the top, this is the MAJ, and this is the aponeurosis extending. This was very common for the aponeurosis to extend over the eye and into that orbital septum. Versus in this picture, we can see over here, the, ap the aponeurosis that's right here extends and attaches straight to that superior tarsal plate. For the fat pad, we found in every single eye that we dissected to exist, and it was always superior to that levator aponeurosis. Bringing us to our conclusions. So to sum up our results, what we can conclude is that we're adding to the anatomic and surgical literature that these, what are these eye measurements? So the MAJ on average is about 14 millimeters back from that central upper eyelid. The LPS aponeurosis most commonly ranged from 11 to nine millimeters in length when we're trying to remove it in these procedures. And that there is more than one attachment point for the LPS aponeurosis itself. Also, we take, took note that the fat pad will always exist and it will always be superior to the LPS muscle. When we're thinking what is the clinical significance of this, we had three main points. The first being that the MAJ and the aponeurosis length. We're thinking of oculoplastic procedures. When we do an internal or external levator procedure, the, the surgeon usually makes an incision and has to find a ligament in the eye in order to find where does that MAJ kind of lie. Given our um, uh, statistics and our samples, we can kind of see where on average now, where are we looking, how far back from that central midpoint, we can look about 14 millimeters to look for that our MAJ itself. Also, when we're doing these procedures, such as the internal, external um, levator uh, treatment, we can think how long of an aponeurosis can we remove before we even hit the MAJ. Next, we're thinking about that variability in attachment points to the, um, of the LPS itself. Uh, it's known that the LPS does attach to the superior tarsal plate, but now we're seeing the aponeurosis actually extend to the orbital septum. And we're thinking, does this make a difference on patients who present with ptosis? Are we more prone to have ptosis if we only attach at one point over the other? And the last point we wanted to think about is that fat pad existence. Now, remember when I talked about mechanical ptosis, fat or excess tissue sitting on top of the muscle can cause ptosis itself. So we were thinking, what about removing the fat pad as a new treatment option in patients who present with ptosis? Or what if we're removing um, excess uh, aponeurosis and removing the fat pad that requires that secondary complication of a secondary uh, procedure? 
Further advancements I, didn't want to let, I did want to let you guys know is being taking place right now. We actually are running histology on all of the samples that we um, dissected downstairs in lab. And we're increasing our sample size because we just got new cadavers as well. So what we're trying to see is if we can actually see where that levator muscle turns into aponeurosis, and then it's specifically attaching either to the superior tarsal plate or going into that orbital septum at the top. I want to acknowledge everyone who helped us in this project. And here are our references for today. Are there any questions? <laughs>